up, fellas? My name is Tucker. The Phoenix Suns season, unfortunately, is over. We're going to talk about their playoff run. We're going to talk about what they can do this offseason to improve. Let's go and get into it. Okay, Phoenix, this playoff run. Full transparency, once the Nets got knocked out of the playoffs, I was rooting for the Suns. I thought that this was a really good team. It was a cool team. It was a team that I, I really enjoyed watching all season long. And I wanted Chris Paul to get a title. So once we got to the finals, I thought the Suns were going to win in six. I thought that... Milwaukee just wasn't going to be good enough offensively, consistently enough, and Phoenix should be able to shoot better, and I thought Paul and Booker would be better at the end of games, closing games, and generally, you know, finals games are going to be close, and they're going to have a better ability to, to close those games out. Through the first two games, I was feeling good. I was feeling confident. They were getting pretty much everything they wanted offensively, uh, driving kicks, corner threes, uh, you know, Chris Paul had an awesome game one. Devin Booker was struggling at certain points early in the series, but, you know, they were still winning games, so I wasn't really concerned about it. And DeAndre Ayton continued to look like the guy that he looked all postseason long, just walking into 2010s. And it, it, things started to shift. Obviously, game three is a blowout, but it, even as bad as I'm sure it feels right now to be a Suns fan, where you're up two on the finals, you're two wins away from winning the title, and then, and then you lose in six games. I think it's important to point out that as much Milwaukee love as there is right now, and deservedly so, Giannis played out of his mind. Those guys had an incredible stretch of games. Game five, especially offensively, was out of control for Milwaukee. Games four, five, and six were all games that Phoenix could have won. Hit a couple of threes here, get a couple more defensive rebounds here, and you know they absolutely could be could be champions. And and so as much positive stuff as there is right now about Milwaukee, uh, there should be some positive stuff about Phoenix here as well because they, they had every chance to win the title and these were still close games despite how well Milwaukee played, especially the last couple games in this series. But ultimately, this run is going to have two kind of storylines to it in a negative way for Phoenix. The first being the injury stuff and some of the teams that they played. No Kawhi in the Clippers series, uh, a limited Anthony Davis and potentially LeBron in the Lakers series as well. And I kind of was always saying, hey, Phoenix is really good. Phoenix is really good. I, they can't really help that their guys aren't getting hurt and the other teams are. They dealt with their injury scare in round one when Chris Paul had the, had the stinger or whatever the case may be. And all they can do is, is play the team they're playing. And I thought they played well and I thought they were really good. And I think it showed. I don't think you get up 2-0 in the finals against a good Bucks team on accident. The other part of this, though, is going to be the Chris Paul thing and, and what this does for his legacy, which reaching the finals for the first time is an improvement. Two wins away from the finals is an improvement. But, you know, with the exception of a, of a pretty good game six, it was a weird Chris Paul game because it was it was a higher volume, like shooting wise than you would expect typically from him. But it's still a good game. The last or the, the, the prior few games in the series, though, were just not good Chris Paul games to the point where people were wondering, is he tired? Is he hurt? Here's where I land on that. Yeah, I'm sure he's a little bit beat up. Most everybody is. Yeah, he looked a little bit tired. Here's what I think it was. Chris Paul was matched up against P.J. Tucker for most of games one and two and was cooking them. I mean, they getting everywhere he wanted to go. And for most of game six as well, when, when Chris Paul was playing well, P.J. Tucker was the one guarding him. And I, I think those rough moments for Chris Paul in the middle of that series and towards the end of it, come mostly from being defended by Drew Holiday. I mean, Drew Holiday is one of the best perimeter defenders in the league. He provides an especially large issue for Chris Paul because of the length and the quickness that he has. And I mean, Paul's 36 years old, right? And when it, when Drew Holiday is defending you full court for 40 plus minutes a game, it, it's going to be really tough on him. And I, I think, yeah, there's some there's some tiredness and, and there's some injury stuff. But quite frankly, he got outplayed. And then the the one big offensive Drew Holiday game in game five was when Chris Paul was guarding him. I mean, he... he got outplayed by Drew Holiday in the finals. I think that's the bottom line. You can talk about injury stuff, and maybe it'll come out that there was some kind of significant injury, but he just he just didn't play well. And Milwaukee, I give credit to them. They did a good job of of forcing him into tough mid-range shots and taking away some of the typical uh, you know passing outlets that he would take. And just a lot of uncharacteristic Chris Paul stuff with turnovers, but I think that has to do with Milwaukee's length and the way they were defending him. And ultimately, those are kind of going to be the two legacies of, the, of, of this playoff run is the injuries of some of the teams they played and then you know, the way Chris Paul played in, in games three, four, and five in the finals. Ultimately, though, like I said, there's still a lot of positive things here for Phoenix. I mean, think about, like, imagine being disappointed as a Suns fan, which of course you are, you're two wins away from the finals, but think about where you were 12 months ago, right? Thirty, A 30-win 30 team that, yeah, went 8-0 in the bubble, but you have no idea what you're going to do from there. It, it, it was a crazy run for them. 
And this is still a team that's going to be around. Like, they're not going to disappear. Obviously, Denver will get healthy, and, and the Lakers will get healthy, and the Clippers will get healthy, and there's 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 a lot of teams to contend potentially next year in the West. It's not like Phoenix is going to walk back into the finals, but I wouldn't necessarily count them out of improving this offseason or you know, just being back in contention, or, you know, in and around the finals again next year. But we got to talk about the offseason stuff now. Uh, there's a lot more to cover here for Phoenix than there was for Milwaukee when it comes to offseason stuff. The first is, of course, Chris Paul. I've, I've probably made three or four videos about this at, at, at one point or another in the year. What is Chris Paul going to do this offseason for agency? And in a very weird way, what is Phoenix going to do with Chris Paul? Because there's multiple considerations here. Do you want to commit big money to a 36, 37-year-old point guard at this point in his career? And or will Phoenix be willing to at the ownership level regardless? You know, uh, Robert Sarver's never been a, a, a big spender type guy. There's some speculation that he uh, will kind of put a budget on whatever this Chris Paul extension could possibly be. I'm going to go ahead and cut through all that. I, I can't imagine there's any way Chris Paul ends up anywhere other than Phoenix this offseason. I, I truly can't imagine that being the case. There, there's no way Phoenix lets him walk and they just made the finals. I can't imagine he goes anywhere else. I think one of two things happens here. Either he opts into the 44 for next year in addition to signing an extension that works out to be about $100 million over three years, or he declines that player option and does the same thing where it's three over 100 or 100 over three or maybe a little bit over that. That's kind of what I think is going to happen. I think that, that works out for both teams. There's no way that Phoenix is going to just let this guy walk. I think Chris Paul's coming back. The more interesting stuff here, though, when it comes to expenditures and, and, and what this team's payroll is going to be at moving forward is... DeAndre and Mikael Bridges are in the same draft class. So next year is the last year of the rookie deal. So in 2022, those guys are going to be on new contracts. And with the way they're playing, Bridges had some rough moments in the finals, but I think he's a good player. It's going to improve. Aiton, of course, improved tremendously during the postseason. Those guys, I mean, if you want to tell me that DeAndre Ayton's agent is negotiating for a max extension right now, I wouldn't be surprised. And, and Bridges between 15 and 20. Like, th those guys are going to be expensive, and rightfully so. I mean, they're incredibly valuable players. But when you start looking at Bridges at 15, Ayton at, you know, 25 to 30, Booker at 33, Paul at 36, all of a sudden you're looking at, oh my gosh, this is our four guys who are paying 122. And it, all of a sudden things kind of tighten up in terms of improving the roster. Now, granted, there's still plenty of good players on this roster. Uh, Jay Crowder's under contract. Sarge hurt, is unfortunately hurt, but he's under contract. Uh, Camp Johnson a couple more years on a rookie deal. Javon Carter is still there, although he didn't really play for them down the stretch. There's still options for this team. They're still going to have a really, really good group. And, you know, whatever they do moving forward with the extensions, I'd imagine that core four of guys of Paul Booker, Aiton, and Bridges are all going to be back. And they're going to continue to be a very, very good team because of, you know, some of the complimentary guys they also have. The other really interesting uh, free agency candidate here is Cameron Payne. I can't believe I'm saying that. I remember campaign two years ago, like he was he was a meme on NBA Twitter. Nobody wanted to talk about anything other than campaign just being one of the worst players on an active roster in the league. I'm not even going to pretend to understand what campaign's value is. I'm sure he would like to stay in Phoenix because of kind of what they've done for his career, continuing to kind of learn behind Chris Paul. Maybe he's the next guy up after Chris Paul, but imagine like campaign in New York or something, right? Like maybe he's just a heat check guy that goes around. I don't know. He, they could potentially lose him hundred percent. And that would be a pretty significant, um, you know, kind of blow to their, their bench unit with that wasn't all that great in the finals to begin with. The one thing I want to point out here though, that kind of killed this team is the Jalen Smith pick with the 10th pick in the draft last year. So everybody kind of, for the most part, I remember most, most people kind of being like, ah, this isn't a great pick. I don't love it. But when you look at their roster, like it, it's kind of exactly what they needed. And it's, it's pretty clear that they were, they were counting on Jalen Smith to play some minutes this year because they don't have another true backup five in the entirety of the roster. Unless you're counting Dario Saric or Frank Kaminsky and Kaminsky is a guy they brought in in the middle of the year. So missing on that and, and some of the struggles they had with defending size and just not having enough size in the finals is a big, big deal. And granted, he's a rookie. There's still plenty of opportunity for him to improve. It, it's just, it's really significant to me that he, like, he couldn't even see the floor. Like, he was that bad that he, they needed, I'm not even talking about in the finals, just in general, they wouldn't even give him a shot. That, that would be really concerning to me for a guy that was just the 10th pick in the entire draft. Typically, when you don't even touch the floor, it, it doesn't go well for you in the early parts of your career. But at the end of the day, for Phoenix, 
I don't really expect any kind of super dramatic Chris Paul stuff. I don't think they're going to sign and trade him. I don't think he's going to go anywhere. I think he's going to stay. They're going to have their core four guys. It's Booker, it's Aiton, it's Bridges, and it's Paul. With the exception of Paul, all those guys are still young, can grow, can improve. I mean, Bridges is 24, Aiton's 22, Booker's 24. There's still a lot of really positive things here moving forward for Phoenix, and it's not something where I would just say, okay, they're never going to be back again. Is this their best shot, or was this their best shot at winning a title? Was this Chris Paul's best shot at winning a title? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to have another year where the Nuggets and the Clippers and the Lakers all, su all suffer injuries to one of their top couple of guys on their roster, and then Phoenix makes a run of the finals and gets, to, gets up 2-0 in the finals. Now, granted, uh, we said you know similar things about Milwaukee last year and the year before. We never really thought we were going to take them seriously as title contenders. We didn't know what was going to happen with Giannis and the Supermax, and now here they are a couple years later, having won the title and what has been a very, very celebrated title with Giannis staying, not forming the super team, all that. So things can change quickly, and I never want to be kind of too overreactionary especially when you're dealing with a Phoenix team that is this young. They do have decisions to make. Got to figure out the Chris Paul thing. Got to figure out the extensions for the young guys. But I still really like this team. I still really respect what they did this year. It was a crazy, crazy turnaround. And despite the disappointment of how the season ended, I don't want that to kind of let us lose sight of the fact that it was a great year for Phoenix, super successful, and they'll have every opportunity to be a top five team in the West next year again and see if they can make another run at this thing in the postseason. It has to give you confidence as a young team. When you know Being in finals games and getting that playoff experience at such a young age, there's an opportunity for improvement here still from guys like Aiton. I'm not saying Phoenix will be back, but I'm saying they're going to be heard from as long as Chris Paul is healthy and still a good player. There you go. End of the season there for Phoenix. And like I said, I'll kind of do an end of the, the uh, NBA season video at some point coming up here soon. But that is going to be the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like rating. Consider subscribing to the channel as well for more NBA content every single day. Once again, my name is Tucker. I hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day. And I will see you all next time.